everybody, welcome. You're all so punctual, I'm impressed. <laughs> Everyone's sitting ready to go right on two o'clock. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Kathy Bellov. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Global and Research Engagement, and it's my pleasure um, to chair this meeting. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Gadigal land, and I acknowledge Gadigal elders, past, present, and emerging. It's really amazing to think that Indigenous people have been caring for this land, the waterways, for many, many tens of thousands of years. So the CPC is 10 years old. 10 years. How many of you were here 10 years ago out of interest? It's a couple, about, maybe half the room. I was here as well, and I, I'm actually based in the gun building next door and my office looked straight over this building site as the CPC was being constructed and coming out of the ground um, and at one stage they started putting the cladding on and I got this eerie gold glow in my office every day when the sun would hit on the cladding so I'm quietly happy that they're putting the cladding on but I did need to reorganize my office so that I wouldn't get the glow on my computer screen. Um, so for those of you who, who only joined the university recently, I think it would be easy to just think of the CPC as part of the fabric of our university. Everyone knows the university. We all think of it as having been here for a very long time. But actually, 10 years ago, it was a really bold move to make the decision to set up the Charles Perkins Centre. Um, it took a huge investment. Um, both of time and resources, but also beliefs that setting up something like this was possible. It was our first MDI, and at the time, um, this will be a test for all of you, it was known by an alphabet soup of C's and O's and D's. Can anyone remember what it was called back then? Santa for obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular. <laughs> But Senate had the good sense um, to rebadge it, rename it, and name it after our first Indigenous graduate, male graduate, Charles Perkins. And he, of course, um, was very focused on improving, focusing on improving people's lives. And that is what the focus of the CPC is today, of course, with the aim of tackling um, chronic diseases, Diabetes, ob uh, diabetes, obesity, and metabolic disease. And really what's been great around that is the fact that the CBC um, has brought people together from all disciplines to collaborate, to tackle such challenges. And it's been so successful as a concept that it's yielded a lot more new MDIs. Some have come and gone in that 10 year period we're launching two more over the next two years, which is very exciting. And actually, it's also launched similar approaches around the globe. And I know our partners at Glasgow um, are also looking at a very similar model. They'll be here visiting next week, um, UC Davis and others. So the CPC is known around the world for its sort of amazing multidisciplinary work. And the MDIs now are a central part of our research strategy. And they're the heart of our research ecosystem. And with this research ecosystem, we're trying to maximize the comprehensiveness of our university and the level of partnerships that we as a cohort of academics have to tackle the biggest challenges of the world. And I guess it's impossible to talk about the CPC without talking about the beating heart of the CPC. And that is, of course, Steve Simpson. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I say it's our early mid-career. <laughs> Just like setting up the CPC in the first place was bold, I think appointing Steve as the director was bold too, because he's not a medico, he's an entomologist. 
And that has been a fantastic way to bring people from different disciplines together. I'm sure Steve today will talk about the great work that he did with locusts and the work he did to show that locusts swarm um, to, get, to get to their protein and then extrapolate from there to talk about how we swarm. And in our case, it's to swarm to get the chippies on the snack table at, a, at an evening function. But of course, the chips that we're after um, don't necessarily contain the protein we need, but rather the carbohydrates and fats that we don't. But I still go for chippies. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what else can I say? So Steve is an out-of-the-box thinker. I think he sees the big picture, and that's been a big part of the vision of the CPC. He's a visionary leader. And he has boundless enthusiasm and energy. I've never seen Steve look tired or deflated. <laughs> Maybe some of you guys have in this building. Possible to have a conversation with Steve without getting inspired and thinking about your own research in a new way. So to give you some background on Steve, for those of you who don't know, he studied at UQ and then the University of London. And then after that, he spent two decades at Oxford University. And he, when he joined us, he was a Ben Fellow and then a Laureate Fellow. Um, he's a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. And last year, he won the Burnett Medal which is one of the highest honours um, in our field. He was the New South Wales Scientist of the Year. And there's a slew of other awards that I could run through but won't to give Steve time to talk today. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Steve Simpson. He's going to talk a little bit about his own journey here and the CPC journey. And then he's going to teach us how to do the disciplinary, which is great. I'm going to be taking notes because I've got to think about the two new MDIs that are up and coming. We're going to think about what we can learn from what the CPC has done in standing those up. So over to you, Steve. Thank you, Kathy. That's terribly kind. I'm I'm not going to talk about locusts and protein, <laughs> but David and I will in a couple of weeks' time at the Bio Domain Seminar. So that's a, a plug for another talk in a couple of weeks. But I am going to talk about our origin story and our journey in the Charles Perkins Centre. How we and I say we because many of you are in this room. And I'm going to apologise before going anywhere, but I'm going to try and show lots of people and mention names, and I'm going to forget most of them. So please don't feel offended. Uh, there is limited time, and I have limited neurons to try and get all the things that matter. Uh, but there lies my um, similarity to a locust, I suspect. <laughs> but I thought, and I, I'm constantly reminded by this, it's so important to know the history of decisions we've taken, the reasons why we made decisions to do things like the Charles Perkins Center, as Kathy said, why they were so ambitious at the time as an idea, how we got to where we've got, because otherwise there's a risk. Um, we forget the past and we don't learn the lessons, both the good things and the bad things. And in my final reflections, I'm going to consider some of the things that I think have really worked well and some of the things that have not yet worked well but could do uh, with a few tweaks. So as Kathy said, we're named after Charles Perkins, and that was a really crucial decision. It, it freed us from um, having to be a tin with the contents that were described by the label on the outside, the Centre for Obesity, Diabetes and Cardiovascular Disease. It freed us up to be like an amoeba and move around um, this comprehensive university, hoovering up ideas and people and trying to bring them together in new ways, um, which led to the claim that we were creeping in our scope, and I've constantly dealt with that over the years, but it was so crucial. To, to really start to explore the environment of multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity. 
But my personal journey began um, when I was invited by Michael Spence to go to London to sell the Picasso painting, uh, Jean Fille Endormi, which had arrived unexpectedly at the university in the hands of a donor from Texas. Michael and I, many years ago, many, many um, years ago, and many um, cells younger, um, <laughs> sold that painting at auction for $22 million. And that was the beginning of my journey in this project. Michael took me to Fortnum and Mason's, bought me a cup of tea, and asked whether I would put my hat into the ring as the inaugural director. And um, I couldn't say no. But it's worth thinking about why this project was um, initiated in the first place. Why did we do this as an institution? Well, there were selfish institutional reasons why we did it. And they very much came from Michael's view that we had become um, silent into the faculties of the university of uh, uh, there were 16 at that stage, um, if you remember. So we were tasked with bringing the university together across its disciplines and locations and using the opportunity of this building to collate critical research mass to come together to try and address um, a, a major societal challenge. And in so doing, to build new collaborative multidisciplinary research and education that had impact in people's lives, to take the knowledge base of the university and translate it. To do that, we were going to have to design, build, populate, operationalize this building. This building to serve research, education, and to be a prototype and developing in the university a new operating model. How you could deliver this sort of thing in a complex integrated facility to which $400 million were being committed, 285 of it borrowed by the university. And in doing that, we had to establish a new model that co-located faculties across the university, both wet and dry researchers. The building was designed to have both types of people in the one place. And to do so by bringing university academics together with um, um, our colleagues at medical research institutes, two in particular, the Heart Research Institute and the Centenary Institute, and also to integrate seamlessly with health and therefore to have a presence from the Sydney local um, health district, uh, district action in the same building. And that we, in so doing, would form a new collaborative community. We'd be shared partners in this academic uh, enterprise, which would offer the opportunity to leverage mutual opportunities available to each of us separately. For society, we had a mission, of course, which was founded around easing the burden of chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, and related conditions. And that gave us the freedom to move um, broadly across the university. And having the name Charles Perkins Center gave us license um, to be awkward, to be difficult, to challenge prevailing ways of thinking, um, and to really think about our relevance to community. The flavour that we took came from, um, that was alluded to in Cathy's introduction, to a background in understanding emergence in complex um, biological systems. Swarming locusts happened to be my thing. But we knew that if you actually take the principles of complex adaptive systems, which are enunciated so powerfully in things like evolution, um, in development, in the, the development of the brain, for example, we might be able to build a new model that could allow us to do things without having to force them into a sort of corporate model of um, managerialism. So the idea was that if we took this um, notion of complex adaptive systems, which has a, a powerful underpinning mathematics, we could harness that to derive a new institutional model. 
we knew that if you set up the model correctly, you'd get a whole load of stuff for free, stuff that you couldn't anticipate, things um, that you didn't have to overmanage. To do that, you have to get the culture right. You've got to make it attractive and easy for people to engage and make it worthwhile for their faculties to let them. Because the model was that we weren't going to appoint our own academics. We, we weren't a medical research institute. We were a horizontal in the university. To do that, we'd have to have rules of engagement that supported ambition, collaboration, sharing, partnership. We had to make it easy for people to find compatible expertise so that you kept both depth and gained breadth. And we needed to have a single overarching mission, but I didn't want to prefigure people's um, uh, engagement with that mission. It wasn't up to me to say that what you want to do is relevant. If you think it is, give it a go. And the very first thing we needed to do was to keep it away from the ethereal and start, start, get things going, get projects and collaborations working. And if you do that, you'll start to build from the ground up new knowledge, interconnections, and things will begin to emerge. And our goal was to go and capture, communicate those things, um, and to foster a generally entrepreneurial um, atmosphere. So that was the idea. And what we've done is moved through three phases in our evolution. And I'm going to take us briefly through the first two before spending a bit more time on where we are now. Phase one involved designing the academic strategy. And that was signed off by what was um, the equivalent of um, the uh, UE in 2020, no, 2012. June 2012. Then we had to build, occupy, and operationalize this building for research, teaching, and clinical work. We had to recruit senior leaders. We had a cluster hire through faculties and schools, which involved um, four professors funded by the sale of the painting. Um, and I think you're all here, or at least three of you are. Um, and that involved a total of 18 professorial recruitments across the university. And they were made by um, philanthropy contributions. They were made by faculties. In some cases, nursing was one, Donna will remember this, <laughs> actually going into the red so that they could support the recruitment of somebody to this project. And Robin Gallagher, in that case, was the professor we recruited in nursing. So it was a period, an intense period of recruitment. And we needed also to grow a vibrant early and mid-career community, which um, we started very early on. That really is the beating heart of the CPC. We had to raise additional external income, including grants and philanthropy, build this new community, develop a culture of sharing and excellence, engage external partners and stakeholders and get the whole thing going. So the building opened in 2014. It was ahead of schedule, but it was uh, under budget. And as you know, it's a remarkable building, the cladding that um, illuminated the Hathis building. Can you um, see my office there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, the cladding's had to all come off and go back on again because of the um, the, the terrible fires in London involving cladding, and that's meant multiple buildings around the university have, now have below um, regulation cladding, and it has to come off and go on again, which is really irritating at the moment for those of us living here, but nonetheless. So that building, as you know, has got a, a clinic, a hospital clinic, which we run under the clinical governance of the Royal Prince Alfred in which we see 10,000 patients or more each year in clinical trials. We have around about 900 occupants, wet and dry lab users in the building, spanning all the disciplines of the university. We teach 200,000 hours of, of teaching in the X lab and other associated teachers. And it really is by any measure the most complex integrated facility at the university. But the project was always to be more than building. And apart from 
not having all the disciplines able to fit in this building, we needed to have presence in some of the, the, the really significant parts of the university's campuses to enable us to actually meet our mission. And Western Sydney provides the most extraordinary um, diversity, ethnic diversity, genetic diversity, socioeconomic diversity of populations anywhere probably in the world. And so working with Western Sydney was crucial. We established um, Charles Perkins Centre Westmead in 2014 um, and the PM in 2016. And both have really gone on to do some, I think, remarkable things as part of the broader project. And we have members across all of the faculties of the university, originally all 16, now of, uh, five of them, and um, we have them across locations of the university as well. The original structure of the uh, design of the strategy was to involve four domains, sort of disciplinary areas, and you'll see them here, biology, society, and environment populations, overlapping and drawn together by solutions, which is how you translate and ultimately have impact. Six cross-cutting themes, nutrition, physical activity, sleep, indigenous health, ethics, politics, and governance of health, and pervading everything, a uh, high capability and integrative system of modeling. And that structure maps onto our, exec our executive committee. Um, Susan's my COO. Here are our domain leaders currently. Our theme leaders, some themes are shared, which is a, a nice way of really um, increasing the scope and, um, and sharing the burden of the leadership of the centre. We have our regional hub leaders, and we have on executive leaders of some of our key initiatives, and I'm going to introduce those um, as we go through. But the way we got things going in the first instance was to go around the university inviting people to come to us with their dream projects around which we could create with small amounts of investment, typically 5,000 or thereabouts to get um, a manifesto developed, a workshop going. We, we call these things project nodes. They're little interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams that have a particular shared project in mind and through the executive committee, we brought these online. We worked with the applicant's simple EOI um, process to start then to generate this um, community of, of um, individual projects. And I'm sure those of you who've seen me speak over the years have seen this, but I'll, I'll just pop it up briefly. It shows the ontogeny of the nodal network over time since the first I think our very first node was the gut microbiome node led by Andy Holmes, um, who's in the room. And then over time, others came online and over time, some died, some merged, some became super, um, super sized, others have spun out. And it's become the basis for uh, the generation of, from embryo ultimately to the, the, the modern Charles Perkins Center. It also was able to provide us with a means to quantify the establishment of new collaborative um, interactions between our members. You created or joined the node, you became a member, you had to do something different to become a member. And as you um, follow the network of members over time, you can do things like map their co, um, their co authorship patterns in peer review publications. So what you'll see here is a gray line joins two members who have co-published something in peer reviewed literature. And you can see how that developed and developed rapidly as you would exactly have predicted it from complex adaptive systems theory over time. And we gave up doing this in 2018. The point had been made. Currently there's 60 nodes. That seems to be the sort of steady state um, of those nodes. They're hugely diverse. They're involving loads of people, many of whom share different nodes with one another. They cross the university and they're doing, in every instance, interesting things. But that was 
phase one. Phase two, we predicted, and again, in theory, we predicted, that emerging out of those initial phases of bringing people together, getting stuff going, we would start to see a couple of things happen. Firstly, the emergence of distinctive core areas of strength across our community. The emergence of bigger things that were sort of super noble, and the development of new partnerships and new evidence of having impact in the world. And this is very similar to, for example, the early development of the brain, where you initially give rise to many more neurons that ult then ultimately end up in the fully functioning mature brain. But you need to start there and you need to get going before you'll start to see the honing and the concentration of activity that leads to these um, new emergent properties. So I think given that this building is um, a, a really significant part of the university's basic biomedical research um, building capital, it's important that we develop a really powerful basic biomedical research program. <laughs> and that has emerged really quite clearly in the area of what we might broadly call metabolic systems biology. Um, it's a way of taking account of the fact that many of the diseases um, that we deal with, chronic diseases, as well as the interactions with infectious diseases, as well as the things that happen with aging, all actually share a common substrate. And they're all powerfully mediated and, and influenced by major elements in our environment. What we eat, how well we sleep, how physically active we are, how um, mentally alert and happy we are. And these, these are profoundly mechanistic questions. And the, fig the figuring from the community here is that if you understand the way that common biology works and particularly how it interacts with the environment, then you've got the opportunity to solve many problems simultaneously, which you don't if you consider heart disease separate from obesity, separate from diabetes. It's a way of achieving common cause and managing one set of problems and having multiple outcomes. Also, we've seen some really significant initiatives, and I'll give you three of them. One was the Sydney Food and Nutrition Network, led by David Robenheimer, not one of the Picasso professors. And that has played a significant role nationally as well. Um, we produced the uh, Decadal Plan for Nutrition Science at the Academy of Science. And this network, which extends way beyond the Charles Perkins Center, is one of the nascent two new MDIs. So we've given birth, as it were, um, to a new MDI. The Cardiovascular Initiative has engaged our colleagues in the Heart Research Institute here and the broader cardiovascular research community, led by Jim Figtree, and it has had also national influence. And the third I'm going to mention is slightly different enterprise. It's the Obesity Collective. And if you go online and look at the Obesity Collective, it came from here, it's led by Tiffany Petrie. You'll see here quite a lot of the time. It's a national whole of society movement that we designed and co-designed across sectors in society. And it's now become the national peak body in obesity. It's a really significant um, operation that has run on very little money to get to the point now where it's having, I think, some of the most significant influence nationally in this space. We've had our CPC early mid-career researchers prosper here. We've got nearly 600 of them now. Uh, we have philanthropic funding that supports their efforts. They run their own affairs. They sit on all of our key com um, committees. They're engaged in um, the running of the place, and they are indeed the beating heart. Each year they have uh, an annual symposium. And even earlier than that, again funded through philanthropy, we've supported the Summer Research Scholarship Program, which has seen more 
than a hundred um, young researchers have their first experience here. And we've got alumni now who are going on to major international fellowships postdoctorally. We've had some real favourites of mine, the Judy Harris and other philanthropically supported writer in residence fellowship, which has seen um, just last week Tracy Sorensen's The Vitals and was launched downstairs. That was the last novel from the program. Sarah Holland Bat last year, poet in residence, had accolades throughout the year, including winning the Stella Prize. And this year we've got Lech Blaine, who's in the audience with us. Here he is, he's sitting second row, and it's a great pleasure to have Lech with us, uh, an extraordinary writer with an even more extraordinary story to tell. We've seen some unexpected <laughs> partnerships. The Qantas work is one. Uh, we're still working um, with them at the moment on the project Sunrise, direct flights Sydney to London, Sydney to Perth. Sveta Osnova is leading our team. She's in the School of Physics, and we've just had success through the ARC linkage program to continue that work. It's been a really extraordinary project. And then we, we have many other examples, Tim Shaw's um, Digital Health, CRC, and then Peter and Philip, our sleep co-theme leads, supported through a, a really very generous contribution from ResMed. We've seen innovation and industry engagement through our own CPC Philanthropic Innovation Development Fund. We work with CDIP on proof of concept funding, supported by Michael Hintze. Um, we've worked with the Business School to develop and um, work with Guy Ford most recently to develop the Global Executive MBA, where they release students into the research ecosystem across the university, including here. We have our engagement with industry committee and we've seen some really remarkable commercialization um, successes. And Tony Weist, who has his lab and his team down on level four East, is, is our star in that um, realm. The other thing that we've done over recent years is really start to take, um, I think, a new approach to, to our Indigenous health strategy. So Jackie Troy leads the theme in Indigenous health, and we've brought together across the university a steering committee, a very high-powered steering committee, to work with us to take advantage of, um, again, another piece of philanthropy, a $900,000 um, donation from uh, Virginia Hood, who's based in the US, and we've been working with our steering committee to try and bind together and unite some of the university's um, indigenous health research, particularly working with colleagues and faculties, cross faculties in DBCR and um, at the um, DBC um, ISS level. And throughout, we've been returning an incredible return on investment. So the amount of money that the Charles Perkins Centre gets each year, which comes through the DBCR, is barely visible on this graph. Um, <laughs> it's around three and a half million dollars that runs um, everything that we run here, against which, and this is accounted for as enabled by the CPC across the institution, um, you'll see the red line indicates how much money CAT1 to CAT4 has come in and enriched the university, all of which flows back to the faculties and schools through the people who are contributing to the projects that yield the outcome. We've had incredible service from our development team. So initially Joel Smith, latterly Peter McGee, and um, CPC did really well in the, um, the Billion Dollar Inspired campaign. We were the third um, highest earner across the university. And recently, we've done extremely well with a request I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment, um, and sitting in a room named after the donor. And as Cathy said, there's been a period of emulation and recognition that has extended globally across um, some key institutions internationally, features and the Lancet prizes and so forth. So it's been recognized as 
having been a really different and interesting way of doing things. Which brings us to our current phase. And I'm going to say that launched with our five-year CPC review. Um, we had a very distinguished panel, um, international and national panel, who were very impressed, it must be said, and made a set of recommendations. Um, and I'm going to come back to those um, right at the very end. We were able, as Cathy said, to celebrate our 10 years um, last year uh, at a special event, including involving the conservatorium in um, and we commissioned the, um, the, the, a, a new piece of music by, by Natalie Nicholas, who co-leads uh, our health and creativity node. And that was just, for me, a very special evening. Sarah read a poem, and it was a chance to come together and celebrate what had been achieved. In the last couple of years, and this was the sort of COVID years, we had the usual run of um, extremely high profile publications. Um, we saw some really um, substantial, uh, substantial individual and group successes. Uh, the Inside Out story is one that I'm particularly um, delighted by, and their successes have just run ahead of um, all imaginable success in recent years, just becoming without question the Centre for Understanding Eating Disorders and sitting them here makes perfect sense. Um, we've had prizes, Eureka Prize uh, Award last year is one to take note of, and we've started to see other things emerging. So over those two years, even though COVID was a real impediment, things continued. And then in 2022, a dear friend, Jenny McKenzie, whose pictures over there and up here as well, left us $22 million. And that has given us the opportunities to start really thinking afresh about how we can seed and develop our future um, without being completely dependent on that rather small um, amount of investment that comes from the university. Direct investment is massive other investment, of course, in the people and in the building. But what we were able to do, and apart from having a party to celebrate Jenny, was to get together and start rethinking our strategy for the future. Rebecca Murray, then the head of strategy for the university, worked with us for a day uh, last May. And We've started to refine the model. This is by no means complete, but we're starting to tell our story in a slightly different way now. The interaction between the biological systems I spoke about, the origins of disease, which reflect everything from our ancient evolutionary origins to our historical past, to um, things that are inherent in population and comparative studies, uh, all the way through epigenetics and developmental um, biology. How that and that interact with our social and, um, and, and, and our cultural environment and our physical environment, and how we model the interactions, how we measure things differently, how we develop new frameworks for thinking about those interactions, and how we ultimately translate that um, through new pathways into health and well-being taking a whole of life course perspective. And this is really helping us to frame how we invest that money and how we develop bigger projects that can sit at the, the middle of that sort of um, spiral in this new diagram. A part of that process is to be, to start managing some of the issues, and, and I'll talk about this in a little bit more, that emerge out of a collaborative community. If you have a collaborative community which is rather unstructured with people um, all chasing their own projects, all with different expertise, sharing their expertise, inventing new expertise, there comes at some point a need to concentrate expertise, to manage the availability of expertise, 
and in some ways to have a quality assurance over what's done in the collaborative community. And that's a rather mature problem for a, um, a community like ours, but it's one that's become evident and the solution to which has emerged seamlessly at the same time. And that is to bring our expertise together and create new nodes or new platforms, as we're starting to call them, where you can take the, the, the world experts and the local experts in a given area and have them as the available resource to work with, not just to service, but to work with collaboratively researchers who wish to engage those tools in their own research. So anybody who wants to do anything to do with Indigenous health has to come through our steering committee. Likewise, Natasha leads the EPI node. Um, if you take Lippin and, and Thomas, they're the ones who you would never think to do anything in single cell spatial biology without talking to them because they have command of the techniques um, and the equipment, much of which resides here as well. And that was part of the original design of the building. Um, the Lifestyle Medicine and Clinic program down in the RPA clinic that Luigi leads is another example. And nobody can do clinical work in this building without going through the clinic, which is co-led by um, Manos um, and, 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 and Sam Hockey. Sorry, <laughs> Luigi. Luigi. Getting in that. Um, and we're launching the wearables in research and public health platform in a couple of weeks. Manos, we should have done it last week, but um, he had a, a health issue. Happily, he's recovered, and that will be launched as the next in these talks. It's the one-stop shop where you go if you want to do anything with wearables, with wearable data. You go to the best people, and they serve as the quality assurance for the collaborative community. We've started to see some really exciting signature projects, some of which began at the same time as we did. Baby 1000 is an example of that. Others are continuing to grow, like the um, Qantas study. Um, we've seen the initiation through Jason Yatsen Lee, who is the member, local member for Strathfield, but also sits on the Senate of what he's calling the Blue Zone Stratfield Project. And we're working with him and colleagues across the university to try and bring that to life. We've got the University of Sydney, University of Glasgow partnership, which is a real partnership involving um, joint PhD students, seminar series, visits, and the like. And a really significant part of the work at the centre is broadly speaking in the biohumanities. And that has built upon um, the ARC Laureate program of Paul Griffiths, the work, including his Laureate work of, of um, Professor Warwick Anderson, and a new developing partnership with Alex Broom and Katie Kinney from FAS um, and their Centre for Healthy Societies, where we're starting to, to really join together activities in different parts of the university around our collaborative model. There are some really significant events that have happened this year and, and are coming. I won't go through them all, but you'll find a list of them here, uh, including we're having a celebration of Paul's Laureate Fellowship towards the end of the year, where his philosophy of medicine for the 21st century program will, will be brought to fruition here. And in doing this, we're contributing to the university's inter and trans um, disciplinary ecosystem. Now, Kathy and Elizabeth have used that phrase, but it's, it's actually very apt. If you look at the connections that I showed you earlier within the Charles Perkins Centre, we share connections with all of the other MDIs. We've seen centres and networks emerging from the CPC, most recently the new um, MDI and food systems, which came from the Sydney Food and Nutrition Network, the Cardiovascular Initiative, which we share um, as a network with the Faculty of Medicine and Health, um, the Health and Heat Research Incubator. So Ollie Jay was a recruit to here. 
and um, outgrew the building and is now obviously over in Susan Wankel with all of his exciting facilities. Likewise, musculoskeletal um, research hub and the digital health and informatics network. We've got profoundly deep and meaningful interactions with our MRI colleagues who are here and elsewhere, of course, HRI and Centenary. We've got Melanoma Institute as a member within us. Um, Richard and, and George, Georgina and their team have just gone on from success to success. We've got Sydney Health Partners here, the local health district inside out. Um, the new Precision Data Science Centre from Science, which is led by Jean Yang, who also leads our uh, theme in, in complex systems and modelling. The Bowden Initiative, the Prevention Research Collaborative, um, the WHO Collaborating Centre, the New South Wales Brain Resource Centre, and at Westmead, Clara Chow has developed her Westmead um, Applied Research Centre. So we're not claiming ownership of any of these things, of course, but they have really contributed to our success, and I would think likewise. And we have, as I've mentioned, um, other faculty centres that we're working with increasingly at the moment. So we're now creating what's seamless across the university in a well-managed collaborative ecosystem. Another of our really big um, forthcoming projects is to redesign our impact and translation strategy. And to do that, we're really working closely with Sydney Health Partners, um, Andrew, Julie, and Don, um, under, and, and under our own leadership, Stephen Pollajuri. That's ongoing and, and a really important part of what we're doing. And we're starting to really bring together some very exciting, much bigger projects. And I'm not going to talk about that now, but I'll leave it hanging in the air. <laughs> So now I'm going to end with some reflections. What, what do we think has worked about the Charles Perkins Center? Well, I don't think there's any doubt that the design of the strategy, the way that we've built multi um, inter transdisciplinary collaborative communities, has pretty well worked, being emulated um, by other parts of the university. Uh, it's given rise to um, a wider university MDI strategy and even a new MDI. It's emulated internationally and it's even been used as a study of its own right. So it's quite metaphysical this. And today, um, Natalie Spence, where's Natalie? Here she is, um, who's part of the team led by Lena Marcus Guys and Peter Goodyear um, and Cara Ridley, who's left the university. They've been using us in Sydney Nano as their subjects in a project um, to design interdisciplinarity. How do you do it? Um, and here's a physical manifestation of that. It's a, it's a deck of cards that I think Cara was the designer of. Was she in the money? Cara and Jen Mosley. Right. Um, and I've got four copies for anyone who's really interested. <laughs> and you're, you're already part of this research project because. Natalie records and attends all of our committee meetings, all of our talks um, at all levels, and we're grist to their research mill, which is tremendous. Um, we've seen great success in this model in recruiting and retaining academics across career stages. Some of the university's most significant academic hires and retentions have come through um, the CPC. We gave rise to the technical support service model. That was born here. It was designed into the way we operate our labs and our teaching spaces. It's gone on to populate the rest of the university. We have an operational model for this building, which has, again, informed the rest of the university. We know now how to build complex buildings and how to design laboratories like the X lab. There are lessons here for the SBA. And we're doing our very best to make sure that the things that worked and didn't work are, are, are really fed into the design process for the SBA. I'd like to think that we have given rise to a new model of philanthropy, um, where a big vision allows you to attract people in, enthuse them, yet give them plenty of space to find their sweet spot, whether that be supporting a writer in residence program an early career researcher program, 
um, or supporting a, a, a body of work that can continue to seed activity across the decades of the Charles Perkins Centre. We developed new ways of engaging in really, um, really, I think, significant external partnership where you work with an external partner in a way that both enriches you and them and enthuses both sides equally. Um, We've also, however, had some challenges and there are some risks. I think one of the risks is as we become more and more multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary across the university, it can go rogue and it needs to be managed. And I've talked about one of the problems of managing quality assurance in collaborative communities. Um, but there are others. There, there are risks of cannibalism between different multidisciplinary programs and diffusion of expertise throughout networks, um, which do require concentration and active management. And this is an area that I think my MDI um, director colleagues and I actually understand and would like to put our hands up on behalf of the university to lead into the future with Cathy and her team um, because we know how to do this stuff and we don't have a particular disciplinary perspective that we're trying to protect. So that to me is a risk and an opportunity. There really is a, a need to think afresh about the financial model. The model is, as I said earlier, that we enable success, um, but that money never there's no requirement for any of that to come back and be reinvested in the project. That's uh, a challenge that uh, the university is starting to think through at the moment. If it comes to the point where enabled success goes elsewhere, but then our priorities are not their priorities, it'll never come back. And that is not really a helpful stakeholder mutual partnership. Part of the challenge, and this is inherent in, and I think it's a positive tension, a productive tension, is with the verticals in the university. Engaging with the faculties and how do we do that most productively, given that they're our stakeholders, they're the ones who contribute to SCAR, they're the ones who ultimately pay the bills, um, but they're also our beneficiaries, and it's understanding how we have mutual responsibility in those relationships that does need some fixing at the moment. We need to, we think, um, consider again academic recruitment and retention. These are things that are done as they should be through the faculties and the schools, but those decisions need not take any account of the MDI strategies, and we think that they should. Space in this building is a, another major point of contention at the moment. We've always been uh, a good citizen right from the beginning when I chaired who, uh, the committee to try and understand who should come into this building and under what circumstances. Maintaining the integrity of the design of the building in relation to the function and the strategy of the centre is crucial. Otherwise, you end up with a hotel or a holding pen. Um, that would be um, problematic. We need to have an eye to how this building sits in relation to the broader precinct, um, particularly the SBA, the hospital redesign. We've got our colleagues in Sydney Nano, Brain and Mind. But more than that, we have presence in other precincts out west at Westmead and the PM. We need to have a mind to making the most of those uh, environments and we're willing and able to make, um, I think, important contributions in those conversations. And finally, and this is a point probably which is totally intractable, what is our role in education and professional training? When CPC was set up, it was called the multi Faculty Research and Education Centre, um, and it was governed by and it was invested in by both DBCR and DBCE. Um, it's been very difficult to break down the EPS or barriers, even though 
We don't want the answers. We just want to help build multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary education. Now, funny enough, those issues um, were identified in our five-year review and also the reviews of other MDIs in recent years. So, MDI, multidisciplinary initiative, it's kind of a bad name because multidisciplinarity is not an end, it's a means to an end. And so when we got together a year or two ago, the MDI directors reconceived that as MDI 2.0, which is mission-directed initiatives, <laughs> taking the following logic. If you're going to solve complex problems, um, you're going to be able to gain social license. That's what community expects of us especially in a post-COVID world. And we know that the most challenging, um, uh, the, the most complex challenges facing the world at the moment require many disciplines to come together. You won't find a collection of deep expertise anywhere better than in the large, comprehensive, globally highly ranked university. So we're the best place to do that. And we also have lots of young people coming through um, so we have this constant flow of brilliance, talent, and energy. But that only works, and we only work, if the schools and the faculties are really strong and deep in their relevant areas. They have to be excellent. And where we are given license to roam across the university, convene groups across disciplines, and have the authority to, to deliver our strategies on behalf of the university, and its faculty uh, and school participants, stakeholders, and beneficiaries. And it's therein that lies becoming more um, than the sum of our parts. So on that note, I'd just like to say thank you to absolutely everybody, not only here in this audience, but to everybody who's been involved with this project to make it all happen at all levels um, of the professional and academic staff at the university. We have an incredible um, operations team here. It's a small team. It helps run this building and it is um, oiling the wheels for everything that I've spoken about and making sure that we maintain our focus on ultimately on our mission. So with that, I would like to thank you all um, and I've taken up the entire hour, so there's no time for questions. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. We can squeeze in two questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love to run to time. <laughs> Another question for Steve? particularly about CPC 2.0. Yep. Mouse. Thank you, Steve. Um, is the end of phase three fixed or do you think that uh, it is, uh, there is a benefit and advantage to letting the phases being open-ended so that... Uh, yeah, look, look, I... I'm, I'm not sure I want to get too little about our phase uh, structure. They're sort of kind of arbitrary lines, but they, they're helping explain the trajectory of development, I think. Um, you might argue that we've never quite finished phase one nor phase two and phase three. Is there a phase four? Actually, I don't mind, providing we're still doing interesting things, we're growing, um, and we're getting past because what we are noticing is that we're bumping up now against some of these challenges that need fixing. And um, that really is where a lot of effort, I know Cathy's engaged deeply in this and Elizabeth Cowley is as well within um, Emma's team. Um, if we're really gonna make the most of this, we need to start thinking about how to invest in it differently um, and at a, a higher scale. And, Otherwise, I just look at, say, some of our competitors who in many ways are much smaller than us in their ambition, like um, 
if, if if you go to London um, and 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 you 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 go to some of the big research institutes there, um, they have hundred million dollar budgets a year. They're still supported by their host institution, um, and my offsider in that role there has a very different set of challenges that we do here. This is in the model that requires vast investment. Actually, if you put too much money into it, it won't work. If you put too little, it won't work either. Um, it's a matter of getting that sweet spot. How do you invest most efficiently to make sure that um, the, the um, I, I think the synergy happens and continues to happen? Right, one question. I, I see. Yeah. Um, yeah, yes, it's a pleasure being a first fleeter, perhaps. I don't know we call ourselves. You are a first fleet. <laughs> um, yeah. Just as, as you know, I've had the privilege of being in a number of Aboriginal communities, getting embedded in some communities recently. And I'm just wondering if in the MDI too, we could look at new ways of really engaging with communities, not just Aboriginal, but other communities as well, and actually really using that to drive kind of citizen and community led yeah. research yeah. throughout that, throughout our disciplines. I mean, I reflected on being a reproductive biologist, which is where I started when I was in the communities, and just thinking if I'd been exposed to that when I was a young researcher, it would have transformed the way I thought about yeah. research in that respect. No, that's in your exactly right. right. And, and so your expertise, for example, in implementation science and digital health, uh, and the work we're doing with the team from Sydney Health Partners is, is really aiming in that direction. The steering committee in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health likewise. Um, it needs to be designed and managed properly, and it needs to be engaging with community more strongly. Um, and, and that is a, a crucial part of that redesign of the implementation strategy for the centre, and, and you're a key person in that action. So. Excellent. Well, I'm conscious of time and the fact that everyone has to run to meetings. So please join me in thanking Steve for a great talk today and for the next 10 years. <laughs>